fun. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Davis and Pete can't have a conversation unless they are recording it so they catch up live on YouTube slash the take cast. Uh, this is, I don't know, like the eighth time we've done this. Pretty fun. We're, we're just going to shoot the shit, chat about uh, really the things that are interesting to us. We'll probably do some talking past one another. Always good. Um, I mean, look, you, we, we got you, we got you to stop drafting super flex best ball teams. These, these sick people, Peter, it's the, the, the tournament launched on Monday and it's half full. It it's insane. Especially when you think about it, you, there's going to be some overlay. It looks like in the albatross, like, which is a pretty fun contest. It covers all four of the majors. Yeah. There's so much excitement with masters week and people are ripping in super flex drafts instead of golf, uh, drafting for the masters. <laughs> Which is is nuts because the Masters, generally speaking, gets people who don't love golf to bet on golf and to watch golf. Like I, I would assume, I, I, I mean, I was telling this to Liam yesterday. I was like, this is not going to overlay. This is fake overlay. Like this thing is going to fill. Like when Levitan starts tweeting about golf overlay, that's when golf overlay starts to disappear. But I, I think, I think it might not. I think it might actually overlay a little bit. The only thing that hurts a little bit is I like I've gotten obsessed with the NBA playoff best ball format and you know I don't know anything about NBA but like I love the puzzle of playoff best ball and thinking about like advancing and fielding a final team like there's no fun wrinkle to the golf stuff like I was asking Jennings yesterday on the club show and he's like you just draft the best players like there's no correlation there's really like nothing strategic and so everyone's just ripping in auto drafts Andy's setting up thing to like randomize ranks just to get some slightly different texture and I'm like I'm excited to have a sweat, but it's not as fun of a draft experience. No, it's not. I think uh, I think the rule is anything, or 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 the rule would be uh, the less correlation matters, the less fun drafting yeah. is, right? And so because NFL is so heavy on the correlation, because playoff drafts are, tw I mean, playoff drafts are like three x the correlation, um, bo both for both for NBA. I mean, the uh, figuring out the brackets and everything, and doing it that way is all fascinating. I mean, it's, it's, uh, that I think you're right. I think that like, just, I had never really processed that until right now, but I do think those underdog NFL playoff drafts were my favorite drafts. They really are. And I'm telling you, Davis, like, I mean, those are the peak for me because I at least know football. And so it's funner to be like, Oh, the Jags are undervalued right now with the NBA. I know nothing about the NBA it's almost as fun for me drafting these teams because it's like putting these puzzle pieces together. And then I'm also, it's like, I feel like I'm stumbling upon like a treasure map when I hear a tweet that's like, oh, the Wolves are no longer going to make the playoffs. I'm like, oh man, I better stop drafting uh, Cat and uh, Anthony Edwards at the end of my drafts. Like uh, as a wild west for drafting in a format I'm familiar with, it's, it's a very enjoyable experience. I actually could see, I mean, I would assume that this is, would the badge bros agree with this, that like all the, the edge is larger in all non NFL sports that like doing baseball drafts and like, what are the, what are the streets like in NHL playoff drafts? Like those have to be, those streets have to be very inviting. Well, yeah, because like there's the guy, I don't know if you've seen him, uh, DJ Mitchell. He, uh, people have been like tailing his underdog pickums and he's like really deep into the hockey streets. And he just absolutely crushed the the underdog hockey best ball stuff. He finished first. He had a team like 12th, 15th, and he knows hockey really well. It like actually was able to realize his ROI and his edge in a smaller contest where he had like huge domain expertise, where it's like you could be the smartest NFL best ball player in the world and good luck, you know, realize that in best ball mania unless you're fucking pat Corain. Oh, oh man how are Bad you example. how's your how's <laughs> how's your how's your mental health quest on chasing Corain going have you over have you overextended yourself are we like what are just what's your general feeling about that well i did just tell you i'm like 80 entries deep in the dance while knowing nothing about the nba so i'd say it's not going very well davis <laughs> It's not, it's not great. Every, every, uh, every contest I'm just, you know, every time underdog launches something, you just do the translation into how many Karains is that. And like, uh, these, these daily contests are very fascinating to me. Like, I think, yeah. I think I would really like to do the daily MLB ones. Like the, the badge bros love these contests and they just, although the, the, I do love drafting, but the concept of drafting 150 times in one day, for one contest that pays out like $5,000 to first place. I don't, 
I don't know if I've got the dedication to do that repeatedly. Right. And I don't, I assume with baseball, there's some more kind of like correlation stuff you need to consider. But I, I, I mean, like Andy was just talking about this on the club uh, on Tuesday, where what he's now doing, he's one, he's created a Chrome plugin where he can max enter however many drafts he wants at once while setting it on autopilot. So he doesn't have to individually register, do it. He can be like 25 auto drafts, autopilot with one click. Then he is randomizing his ranks. He's like aggregating ranks, but then adding a randomization element. So he doesn't end up like super overexposed to just his ranks guys. And he got first and second in the daily. I think it was Saturday or Sunday night. And it's, so it's like these guys too, they're like automating a lot of it. And with NBA or golf, where you aren't having to worry about correlation, you can actually make it a pretty quick process. I, I mean, I just, uh, I, I hate that. Like I hate the bots. <laughs> I hate the bots. I hate the idea of the games getting more solved than they already are. Like DFS is already so solved and so hard to win and so high variance. I just like, I, I do sort of feel I I'm the boomer now, you know, I'm the boomer where when all the optimizers started to come for DFS, I was like, Oh yeah, this is sick. This makes it easier, but now I don't. I don't want that in my best ball streets. I I understand what you're saying. I feel that way about some stuff. This to me though is more of like I think an efficiency thing. I, I mean, I guess I guess you could make the same op, uh, argument optimizer, right? Well, it's like hand building 150 versus using an optimizer, but there still is like a special sauce to like the inputs, like the Andy stuff. Like anyone can go get the ETR ranks and upload them in for these NBA daily contests. He's just making it a much more efficient process for him. So it's more like saving him time versus like, oh my God, Andy's coming in with this unique strategy that I don't have a capability of in the way that like, I will never be able to have a DFS sim like Brian. Yeah, I mean, but when optimizers first came out, there were it was not about simulating anything. I mean, then do uh, uh, daily drafts will have really jumped the shark when uh, you know Brian is like, all right, I got to start simming out with this ADP and figuring out the exact like unexploitable strategy for drafting. Then, then it'll it'll really not be beatable anymore. Well, I do feel like we will probably have a tipping point, right? Where if the daily prize pools get big enough, like the whole argument against best ball in general is tying up your money. It's why the guys like Brian aren't blasting off. But if the prize pools get bigger and they can churn their money over a regular slate like they can on the DFS sites, like maybe those guys do start to dip their toes in the waters. I mean, that is sort of interesting. Like, I guess it sort of relates to underdogs, like corporate goals. Like these, I... I, again, I don't know. I don't have any inside information, but my my guess would be that long term, these daily contests are not a big part of their like vision board. You know, they they want to churn the pickums and the rivals and and expand that stuff. So maybe maybe it does just sort of remain a small little niche thing that big high volume gamblers don't even feel the need to set up anything for. Yeah, and I think there's truth to that in general because they're obviously the most hyper engaged users are the people who are playing all the game formats, you know, the best ball drafts. And we all have very specific feature requests, right? Like you'll always hear the like, I want to be able to sort by ADP and by my own ranks, like toggle back and forth during a draft. I also think that would be a very cool feature. And you'll hear, and I'm pretty sure they've said this on the record. I don't think I'm speaking out of school, but like you'll hear someone like Rudman say, you know, we have all these features and yet when they go to their coders and their developers, like they are scaling up the pick them stuff. They're devoting resources to these other things that actually make the business way more money. Like this is such a small part of their ecosystem. And yet we are the loudest, you know, minority wanting these things. And so they're constantly having to wrestle. How do we make our core users happy, but also knowing like devoting all of this manpower and resources to this one little thing that like a small handful of people are going to want. Is it probably the best use of their time? Well, it's definitely not the best use of, of their time. I guess it sort of becomes interesting. Like, I mean, even, even let's say best ball mania four is even bigger. They make it even bigger. It's huge. It's $3 million in the first place or whatever. I mean, how much rake do they generate from that tournament versus one month of major league baseball pickums? Like they probably make more money on one month of major league baseball pickums than they will. But obviously, 
a huge, but I, I mean, I think they probably view best ball as like customer acquisition money, right? It's like, that's how you, you get people onto the app to draft their best ball mania team. They get paid out and they're like, Oh, go bet some tennis unders or whatever. Well, and think about it this way. Think about how much, you know, I know I'm an anomaly, but I know a lot of people love sweating their teams and watching that, that, uh, that pot boil throughout the whole season. So you have a vehicle that gets people constantly back on the site, right? Oh, and now there's a daily contest. Oh, now there's a pick them or whatever, but like the best ball element, like people love sweating best ball. And that's a big feature request from all of us. It's like, make it easier for us to sweat these teams on the giant leaderboard. Let us search for a player and then immediately pull up all the teams we have them on. Like that's what collectively I think best ball players want is reasons to be on the site even more, which I do think underdog and the users probably meet in the middle on that one. Well, yeah, yeah, no, I think, I think they do. It's like, we all, we all sort of understand what we are signing up for. I guess I just, what, what bums me out is I'm so much more interested in the small little games, the, you know, the super flex contests, playoff best ball, like, like legitimately innovative contests that are fun, have small wrinkles. There's no real reason for Brian and Utakao and Osimo to load up on these because the, the money for them is not there. So you, the, the games don't get immediately solved. Uh, and it just feels like the longer that this stuff continues to exist, either the prize pools dwindle to zero or the prize pools have to go up, which brings in action that we don't want. It's like definitely, uh, it's like a little non-sustainable probably. Right. And I do think that's why the badge bros have had a lot of fun with the daily contest because it is so less of a solved thing. There's a, the wild west right now with strategy on all of these and people are piling in and now you have smarter people like someone like Andy, who's like a giga brain solidity dev applying how he thinks about puzzles to these underdog daily and then going on shows and, and sharing how he's thinking about it. Like it is going to accelerate quickly. Um, and it's just a natural thing. I think that's going to happen. And I do think the sites are going to have to start to wrestle with, you know, do they put limits on plugins and stuff in the same way poker sites limited HUDs to some extent to try to preserve the ecosystem? I do think it's a it's an interesting problem that they're going to have to face over the next couple of years. They probably won't. They probably don't care. I don't. I, I think don't think. They, care. I don't... they they want the games to be. Except they want any casual person who comes in. Like the per, I don't know if you saw, but the NBA season long best ball. I didn't. I didn't partake in that. Um, the winner took it down with a single bullet. You know, one team in a one one fifty max contest. They they love that kind of shit, right? Like you want to be able to have the Chris Moneymaker type stories where it's not necessarily a one fifty max that anyone can put a lineup in and have a chance. I think that's the dream you always want to sell. Is that? I mean, I guess it would just come down to like what they want marketing wise. Like what, what do they want their marketing message to be? Cause like they probably eventually they want to be a casino basically, right? They want to be, they want to be a uh, DraftKings fan duel, bet MGM competitor on, on your phone with forced parlays. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know the, I mean, in general, all the sports, right? Like, the whole crazy thing about DraftKings, and we were talking about this on Lulz the other day, it's like, okay, we joke, they don't care about be uh, best ball, obviously. They don't care about DFS. I think that's pretty obvious too. I think you could start to argue they don't even care about sports betting because they just want people to come play roulette and blackjack. That's where all the money is at. Yeah, they don't even, it, yes, they don't even, they, they, I mean, they, they'll take your sports bets, but they would yeah. much prefer you to be playing online roulette. And that's why I wonder, because one of the things you'll always hear, you know, you'll hear any of the top pros, you'll hear guys like Rufus, the, you know, Peabody, the guys who are really ingrained in sports betting, you'll hear Levitan say they're all like, you know, we want more peer to peer games, you know, the, the sports betting Olympics or whatever it is. But like, if the sites aren't incentivized to grow that ecosystem, why would they ever put a ton of resources into trying to find that format? You know, if they're just trying to fast track everyone past that, I don't know, it's like, and then you saw the, uh, I'm thinking of the DraftKings Sports Betting Championship. And then there was the whole controversy thing. Oh my God, I got forgot screwed. about that. And like why DraftKings is like, this ended up being way too much hassle than it was it was worth. It was a cool idea and there was potential, but then there was so much blowback. And now that what, they haven't done it. There's no innovation around it. The whole peer-to-peer -peer gambling stuff, like now what's going to happen to it? Uh, I mean, the peer-to-peer -peer stuff 
is uh, it's best on decentralized, right? It's best on. Oh, uh, here we go. It's best, it's best. I mean, that's actually like a use case for blockchain that makes sense, where uh, you know your money goes into a smart contract, it get, it enters into a, a protocol. You can you know you you put a request out via blockchain X for matched action, and someone can match your action, or they can't via smart contract, and then an oracle verifies the winner or the loser. There, that probably exists. My guess is there's probably like what I just described probably exists in the real world. Just no one wants to use their, uh, you know, um, their polka dot coin to, right. <laughs> to to wager on sports. Well, and the the big the big thing to make that peer to peer sports betting work is you need huge liquidity, right? Like if someone's putting up something on one side, you need there to be people willing to take it on the other side. And then there's also the element of having to hawk the lines, right? No one wants to be a market maker and then have a sharp that comes and picks you off because you have a stale line. So who has the time and the resources to make sure they constantly have fair lines up? It's just like a tough thing to crack. Although Maybe AI, maybe AI pushes us closer to where people can be more like automated market makers. I guess I, I guess I had never thought about that element of it. But if you are if you are hanging a line, like I say, I go to I go to uh, you, you know um, Uniswap for sports betting, and I say I want the Arizona Cardinals plus six and a half points, but then. Kyler Murray is out or whatever, or, or Cliff Kingsbury comes back is going to coach the team and they go to 10 point underdogs or whatever. I'm, I'm not going to be sitting at my computer. No. I maybe, maybe you install if then statements, you know, like, right. uh, I don't, Oh, then, then that gets all confusing. Maybe the answer is we should just all, uh, you know, seek God and, and do something <laughs> and do something that's less, uh less speculative i don't know i don't know i love but how we I, made it four minutes down this thought experiment rabbit hole and then we're like A actually we should just stop gambling altogether i mean i i i do think i do think your point is that people do always say that i want more peer-to-peer -peer gambling but what they you know what you know, what inherently what you're saying in that is I'd like to fuck over my buddies i'd like to i'd like to get one over on people who don't know any better versus going against the sports book who's got an informational and a computational advantage over me a lot of the time. Well, I, I, yeah, that's probably the crude way of saying it or saying the quiet part out loud. But I do think what they're saying is I want there to be more arenas for me to seek and realize edges, right? Because a lot of people will be like, oh, well, 10 years ago, like these markets were so soft and I made all this money, whether that was like pre, you know, moneymaker, poker boom or whatever, whatever it was. And same with DFS, right? Like five years ago, six years ago, just a solid DFS player could just print. And now it's so tight. And so I think these guys who are professional gamblers and fantasy players, they're like, the edges are evaporating here. The markets are so efficient. The ADP is so efficient. I want a new arena where there's an edge that I can go in and extract from, right? That's, that is what it is. It comes, it really does come down to value extraction, which is, you know, it is what it is. Like the, everyone, everyone wants to be extracting value while themselves retaining their own value and not being, uh, the, the extracted. Right. But, but here, here's where people want to have their cake and eat it too, because people always say that, but then they still want to play on the sites that they like playing on with the best user interfaces. They want to do it with the sports or the, whatever the topics that they're most interested in. And they're already tailing because we've always had the conversation. Like, are there edges probably in some South Korean ping pong matches that you could go grind to become expert in probably, but that doesn't sound fun. It sounds like a, a miserable thing, trying to scrape data, trying to index match random names, trying to like get up early to see when lines open people want edges and in things that they're interested in. And it always happens in best ball too. Everyone's like mad that they didn't have a positive ROI in the puppy. And it's like, dude, you blasted off $5 entries into a massive top heavy contest, but you did it because you were getting entertainment value from that as well. If you were purely seeking EV, you would have put 20 entries or one entry into the Dalmatian for the price of 20 puppy entries. Right. And so people, I think really do want to have it both ways in that regard. Well, yeah, I, that, I think that is maybe even more eloquently said, which is like, one, I don't want to grind my absolute dick off yeah. on something that I'm going to have a huge edge on. You know, I don't want to be, I don't want to be refreshing the odds jam or the unabated screen 
16 hours a day trying to arbitrage bad lines. But I would also like to just settle in for a comfy 10 to 15% ROI. You know, it's like, it's like, I want to live my life. I want to be golfing and going to the bar and doing X, Y, and Z. Uh, but I would also like to be a winning sports better and uh, DFS player and, and, and fantasy football player or whatever. Yeah. And like, you also have to, you know, when Andy was describing kind of his process with the NBA dailies and you see him get first and second and I'm like, man, it would be fun. I, I would love to devote like an hour or two each day to grinding that hard, trying to replicate his process, do my own version of that. Like if I had infinite time in the world, that sounds like a fun way to spend like an hour or two of my day. And yet I, I'm not going to do that because I don't have the time to do it. I probably wouldn't be able to realize my edge and make the time investment worth it. And there's just other things I need to be doing too. So it also comes down to that. Like, are you really willing to actually devote the time to find those edges and then like manipulate them in your favor. And I think a lot of people, they just want them handed to them, right? It's why people want plays. They give me the winners because people don't want to actually do the work to find the edges. No, which is like why the content game exists, right? Is that, is that people want to, and, and I mean, I think to be fair, some content does do that. I think, uh, well, you know, it's, it's so interesting. Like, the the specifically like in our stuff the community is small enough that it really does become like establish the run sets the market like they really like you know leone and those guys like they have such a direct influence on the best ball market that i i mean without without um having access to their tools and their rankings and stuff like you kind of are playing blind compared to the people you're playing against because they're having such an impact on on even like strategy type stuff um which is is not really true in that many areas of gambling that one website or one group of people would have so much influence over the outcomes well and that's that's literally the whole reason andy had to start doing the randomness thing with the regs is because so many people were drafting off the exact same rankings that you were just going to end up going with the herd and that you had to find a way to smartly differentiate yourself from really smart efficient ranks it, it presents a really interesting problem it well yeah it well what do you do you still draft off of uh ranks or do you still draft off of the the base adp in the applet yeah i i don't like i'll do stuff like the one thing i like to do is like i wouldn't ever so this is a good example so the ranks that i uh trust or would like to use the most for fantasy are sean siegel's personal ranks over at rotoviz i just love the way he thinks and how he captures like upside scenarios and ranges of outcomes in his ranks and his ranks will be just like batshit crazy like they will be all over the place like if i were to draft exclusively off of those I would be taking guys six rounds ahead of ADP. I would have zero exposure to some guys I'd want, but I like looking at them and then knowing, oh, wow, you're much higher than market on Jahan Dotson. I'm going to file that away. So when I am drafting off of ADP, maybe I reach a teeny bit for him, or maybe I load up a bit more. That's how I like to do it with finesse, because I do really assume, even though ETR and people uploading ranks are doing that at a higher frequency, I still think the majority of drafters are using default ADP. And I'd rather just know what they are looking at when they're drafting against me. Are you going to be hammering the game stacks as hard this year? Is that, has that become too mimetic or is it actually still close to you mean week seven, week 17 game stacks? Not so not teammate stacks, but the like, Oh, you know, I took, uh, you know, from, from last year it was like, Oh, I took CMC one. So I'm taking Mike Evans at the two, three turn. Um, uh wait say that example again so like remember you know McCa you take McCaffrey at one yeah so then you took Mike Evans at the two three oh turn. assuming he was still in Carolina I got thrown off because I was thinking San Francisco yes, yes. for a second yes. um yes although I do think one thing in it's it's similar with like all that stuff I do find myself in general just wanting to do like stacks and correlation like cheaper because I do think the place where people overdo it is in those early rounds, right? I always remember, what was it too? Like everyone who took Cooper Cup was starting to double tap like Mike Williams and Keenan Allen coming back at the two, three turn. And so those get over 
correlated relative to like the boost they should probably be getting. So I do think like staying away from it a little bit more in the like rounds four and five, just knowing it's such a comfy correlation click is probably smart. But yes, I'm still, depending on how these tournaments are structured, right? Like Josh and Hayden could be so upset with our week 17 bullshit that they just force them into not structuring a tournament that plays into week 17 correlation. That could happen this year, Davis. The the Ertz Algier combo. Yeah. It almost hit. I mean, we were we were centimeters away from Ertz Algier being what you needed in week 17. Well, it's so. it's just a good thing for all the uh the zero RB in, in week 17 haters that Pat's team took two running backs early because my God, if you want to look at a lineup, and I'm actually working on a video. Last year I did the on my Deposit Kingdom YouTube channel, some like produced videos. That was where the week 17 is all that matters video came out. But I'm doing uh anatomy of million dollar lineups, looking at Pat's lineup in the lineup that won first place in the regular season. And now I'm forgetting uh the point. Oh, but I was just saying like the week 17 correlation, and you already know this, but like it is so balls to the wall and Pat's lineup with his Dolphins and Patriots and his Panthers yeah. and Bucks. Like that thing was a week 17 lineup through and true. And uh, you know, it was nice, Davis. I will say I don't get too many tout wins around here, but uh, you know, nailing the week 17 is all that matters does feel good. It does, it does feel it does feel good. And I hope that uh I hope next year. I mean, it'd be nice to keep it in the family, right? Uh, for for four years in a row, for for like a fantasy football nerd who's already in the community. Although, you know, the 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 U the UD anon bros. I mean, four years in a row. Like, if if Michael Leone wins, uh, Best Ball Mania four, the the soft pods for touts bros are really going to get out there. I mean, if you were kind of retrofitting uh, analysis of who was going to win, Davis, I feel like your odds would be pretty good. You know, people who do, you know, regular, you know, shows with me. I mean, Liam, I think I had this exact show background uh, here with, I did my chess streams with Liam, of course, Pat. I mean, maybe, maybe you're next. Maybe you're the next one who gets the, uh, the million dollar score. Oh, God, I need it, man. I'm about, I'm, uh, <laughs> it's, it's April, it's April 5th right now. I'm doing my, my family taxes. And uh, it would be nice. It would be nice to have an extra million dollars. That would be that'd be good. Do you get a tax break for having a baby? You do. Yeah, you get another. You get your first dependent there too. Uh, so yeah. Wow. It, you know, that's big. all get you know getting up with uh with April today at uh, six a.m. It's finally going to start to pay off uh, when that when that tax credit comes. Well, speaking of six a.m., how is your uh, health and fitness routine? changed since being since being a dad uh yeah i mean it's definitely changed i mean i've written about this a little bit in the in the po box um as far as you know kind of how i'm you know i used to go to the gym all the time you know i'd go i don't know i'd go to the gym like three times a week and i'd go to like a, a class like a boxing class like two times a week i'd go to yoga once or twice like i was like you know when i didn't have a kid i was going basically every day doing some kind of fitness, health related thing. And I wrote in the newsletter edition about, uh, uh, my prison workouts where now I, I basically get over to the gym once a week. I can go on like Saturday mornings is the one time I can get over there. And so I'm doing push-ups, I'm doing pull-ups, I'm doing sprints, I'm doing tons of walks. I'm doing basically all body weight, kettlebell, dumbbell type stuff that I just have here. And it has been really interesting to notice that even though I've lost some of like my raw strength when I was doing more stuff at the gym, like all of my functional strength, my cardio, even like my aesthetics, how I look, how I feel are like completely unchanged. And it was scary for me going into it. Cause I'm like, God, I'm going to regress. I'm going to do all this stuff. But I do just found, find that I'm able to get the same benefits, the same results from a completely different approach, which was very comforting to me as someone who was scared heading into it. I mean, I think that's what a lot of people find too, right? Is that if you're not, uh, like if you're not a pure bodybuilder or a power lifter or whatever, there is, you like the, you don't need to be doing, uh, you know, uh, science, Jeff Nipper, uh, science-based, you know, push, pull legs workouts six days a week. You know, it's like, it's, it's nice to be able to do, uh, but I mean, there's this, uh, there's this quote that always sticks with me. Um, I think this was Andy Galpin that said this, but as, as, um, like scientific knowledge of the exercise process goes up, exercise intensity goes down 
because hmm. you're 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 at the gym or you're doing your workout plan and you're like all right and now i rest for 90 seconds and then i need to activate this muscle whereas like you know the bro science people who are just going in and like tearing up their arms or whatever for 90 minutes like those people are are getting their heart rate higher they're they're act you know they're hitting maximal load way more often and i mean from my own experience that is totally true like i've actually i've actually probably put on like 10 pounds the last six months or whatever as i've tried to dial more in on pure strength just getting stronger you know because my my heart rate is i'm not hitting like 150 heart rate most of the time in a workout which is pretty low and it, it all comes down to and i mentioned this before it's like what are you optimizing for right like what you're optimizing for is going to completely change like if i was trying to you know have the uh, you know out bench christian mccaffrey like i wrote about a while ago my current workout routine is not going to do that because i'm only able to bench like once a week at most and so that's not what i'm optimizing for right now and i do think and i think i might write about this for friday too because we can talk a little bit about all the like biohacks and recovery hacks that are so in vogue right now but i think in the same way that prop bets or 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 a program that you're doing or having your own goal of like i want to deadlift this much in the same way those things can help motivate you and help you show up the same thing with those recovery tools right it makes it more palatable to develop a habit and the thing that's been crystallizing in my head is that all of these things that we do to trick ourselves to do healthy things you can arrive at it from so many different directions but where you're ultimately trying to do is develop a sustainable habit for yourself and there's lots of ways and little tricks to do that but that's really the end goal how do you develop a habit that's sustainable yeah that i've never i've never really thought about that but you are you are right i mean that is uh i i feel like that's maybe even taken for granted in so much of the health and fitness stuff out there and like this is not a new observation but like we are in a golden age for un uh, unsolicited health and wellness tips, right? I mean, we're doing it here. You get on Instagram, you get on TikTok. I mean, even even Twitter now is like rewarding the threads of the people who are tweeting out their like supplement stack to help them sleep or whatever. But really, yeah, it is it is just about how do I uh, how do I hack my brain into doing shit or or even even like wanting to do the thing that's good for me and healthy for me and and overcoming the easy dopamine of you know literally everything else right and i think i think what two things like we could use like the cold plunge example right that's in vogue i can't go more than one instagram story without getting an ad for uh you know a five thousand dollar cold plunge we can both one say paying five thousand dollars for a fancy bucket to submerge yourself in is absolutely absurd and a total grip you can also say if a cold plunge helps motivate someone to work out or gets them in the mindset to be more healthy or they feel like there's some kind of adrenaline benefits that they're getting that that sets them up for a good day then it can be totally worth it and like you can get those things in different places where i think people go wrong is when they're saying like you have to do cold plunges that's how you're going to do it and this is why i've always been careful about not hyping up intermittent fasting too much because it's not a magic elixir it's not a magic bullet but it works for me and it fits into setting me up for success in building a sustainable habit that really works for me. And so it's just weird when people are like, oh, you, this one simple trick, you have to do this. And it's like, well, that might work for you, but it not, or me, but it might not work for you. And I think too many people want to assume that what they do, their stack is going to be a one size fits all. And that's just never the case. You, I mean, yes, the, the, if you're if you're not doing cold plunges, if you're not hitting the sauna, if you're not taking magnesium, if you're not taking vitamin D, you're gonna die. And like this uh, this podcast you were listening to, and there was an article. What what's it called? The the uh, plain podcast? English, yeah. plain English. So so they're doing this bit, and they bring on these guys who sort of are like debunkers. That's sort of like their thing, yeah. and they're they're making this point that is so obvious that is. You know, if you are doing this insane, abnormal, like asocial behavior to burn like 15 calories, like what the fuck are you doing? Like if that's your, if your thought process is I've got to do a cold plunge so that I can burn some extra brown fat, like that's insane. That's actually like, you should not be doing that at all. Um, 
the reasons to do it are more like what, you know, I mean, this is very uh, Jocko Willink or, or David Goggins, but it's like, it's like about doing something hard. It's about like forcing yourself to do something hard. Cause that is, uh, I mean, that's, that's hard for me. Like I, I just, yeah. I just got a tattoo so I couldn't do cold plunges for like two weeks while it healed up. And guess what? I haven't done one since it's been, a, it's been a month since I've done one because it's not, it's not in my habit anymore. I'm like, I feel fine. I'm doing X, Y, or Z. And now I'm back to being a soft little baby again. Right. And that like the cold plunge in the sauna thing, it's like everyone wants shortcuts, right? Everyone wants like, to me, the value of it. Sure. Like with the sauna stuff, I love the sauna. Actually, uh, breaking news, Davis, I did, uh, I pulled the trigger and I, uh, I purchased a sauna and within about a month or so I will have a, an at home sauna and I'm wow. not doing it. I'm, I'm sickly jealous of you. Like I am, I, I'm <laughs> like, I'm more jealous of you right now than I am of Karain's attention. $2 million. <laughs> that's the, that's the one thing I have on Karain right now. He probably can't put a sauna in his Brooklyn apartment, uh, <laughs> but I could put one in my basement. How, how oh. rich, this is a, this is a good game. How rich would you have to be to have an at-home sauna in Brooklyn? Like $10 million net worth, maybe more. Well, yeah, because you would have to own your own flat, right? And yes. then, and then yeah. you're talking uh, like a $5 million tag. Uh, but the, I think the point I was trying to make is like, people want to say like, Oh, I don't have to do anything else. I just do a cold plunge and I'll lose a pound a week. Or I just right. do the sauna and I'll live to be 140 years old because of a finished study. To me, the benefit of it is I know that habit stacking with the sauna just compounds for me because I, when, before I get in the sauna, I'm like, I might as well get a sweat. I'll do a quick little workout. And then when I'm in the sauna, I'll say, oh, I'll meditate now. I have 15 minutes of just being completely in here without my devices. And it leads to all of these things. And then on top of it, I get kind of the adrenaline rush and all the other kind of benefits that come from heat shock proteins or whatever other bullshit you want to talk about. But to me, the whole benefit of is it starts stacking up these other habits that I really like and make it easier for me to fall into healthy patterns. And that's ultimately the reason I got it. Not as some like huge indulgence of like, this is going to help me live forever, but knowing what it can do for everything but else. It, but like it might help you live forever. <laughs> well, see, to me, that's just like a bonus. Like I can also be realistic and just know like the sauna makes me feel good. When I get out of the sauna, I don't want to go eat a burger and fries and like four beers. Like I literally don't feel like doing that. Whereas like when I'm hung over the next day, that's all I want to do. So it's just like, it's an, another little thing for me that helps me you know, accomplish, you know, my goals or whatever. Um, so you're not, you don't, uh, you don't subscribe to doing best ball drafts in the sauna. Like you're not, you're not sitting there clicking, uh, Devonte Adams, Jimmy Garoppolo stacks in the, in the sauna. I think people who bring their phone in the sauna, both from like a holistic standpoint and also from like a practical standpoint, if you're going to ruin your fucking phone, uh, because if you, if you can bring your phone regularly in the sauna for 15 to 20 minute sessions, it means you're not in a hot enough sauna because otherwise you're going to be ruining your phone. Well, I don't have control over the heat of my sauna because I <laughs> the one that's at my gym, bro. It does. Um, it does. After being in the sauna for about, 13 to 16 minutes my phone does stop working it does the uh emergency your <laughs> yeah no shit uh, dude your, your phone was not built to be ex your phone isn't getting the benefits from the heat shock proteins like you are yeah but hang I, on tell what me what your tattoo is i glossed over that oh it's i got a mac miller tattoo on my leg i've been wanting to i've been wanting to i've been wanting to get it forever and i hadn't gotten any tattoos since i was 21 22 ish and my wife is not huge on the tattoos but i'm like you know what we're married what are you gonna do you gonna you gonna we're gonna get in a big fight because <laughs> wow. i got a leg tattoo and she was cool with it and it's fine uh but now that i see the thing is is now that i got another one i'm like well, what's stopping me from getting a bunch more and just you know getting uh getting all uh getting all covered in them so i I'm debating that with myself on an almost daily basis right now. Anything I I've always heard from people who've gotten tattoos that they're just super addictive, right? Like just once you get going, you just want more and more. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, you just, you, 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 uh, come up with excuses to look at them in the mirror 20 times a day, which is, I'm such a vain person anyways, that it really, that really works out for me. But yeah, the, the experience it's cool. I don't know. It just, it's, it's very hard to explain, but yeah, it is very addictive. But I think if you asked me why 
like why do you like tattoos so much? I'd be like, I don't know, they just fucking cool. Like they just, you know. Davis, if you with that logic, if you ever got a six pack, would you just do all of your TV shows with your shirt off? <laughs> I mean, I already as with with bigger arms, I'm I already give people, you know, I give people the oh yeah type vibe all the time. Like kitchen kitchen calls me out. It's just, you know, it's it's uh it's who I am and I'm comfortable with that about myself. But- but this goes back to the same thing, right? Like when, when I'm, when my stuff is dialed in, like, yeah, I like being like, oh, I'm, I'm making progress. I have a six pack, whatever. Like these little carrots help motivate us, right? Like knowing that like, yes. oh, I can go flex in the mirror. And yes, there's the bro culture version of it. There's the gym selfies and the mugging and stuff. That's like absurd. But like at the end of the day, you are probably lying if you say that some form of vanity isn't playing into your motivation for working out. Like, I I just think you're probably full of shit if you're not saying that. I think that would literally be a fucking preposterous thing to say. Like if, if there's like a a movement of people out there who like, they're like, I don't, I don't work out for aesthetics at all. I only work out. I mean, maybe there's like a very small segment of people who are like, I don't care. I'm bulking forever. All I care about is moving maximal load. You know, I want to deadlift 600 pounds. I want to squat 600 pounds. I want to bench 350 pounds, 400 pounds, whatever. Uh, maybe, but most people want to look at themselves in the mirror and be like, I like, I like what I see. That's, that's good shit right there. Yeah, no, for sure. And it it is like those internal motivations, you know, are huge. It's why the prop bet stuff, having a specific goal of a weight you want to clear, like, cause otherwise, you know, I, I think I said this in one of my newsletters, like when I'm running sprints by my hill and I'm going halfway up and I'm sucking wind and I just want to stop. I I can say to myself, why not stop, Peter? There's literally no reason you can't stop. You don't yeah. have to keep going. You're going to be fine. Your overall health is going to be fine. But I have to trick myself into saying like, you must continue. Oh, if you want to look like this or someone else is running this faster than you or whatever it is, you need to justify this beer you're having later. It's all just tricking yourself to continue working hard because I'm not wired like David Goggins. So I have to come up with like fucking bullshit to trick myself. I mean, for, uh, for me, the, that's like the function of the Huberman stuff is like, I was like, I don't want to run sprints. Running sprints is like my least favorite thing in all of the world of exercise. But I'm like, if I get six minutes a week of my heart rate above 180 beats per minute, Andy Galpin says I can live five years longer, you know? So I'm like, it's like, I'm, oh yeah, okay. I can sacrifice six minutes of sprinting right now on off to get what I want. You know, it's like, that's, that's like the function of that shit for me. Yeah. And one other thing I guess I would say that, I has been a big thing for me, like holistically with like working out and eating that I couldn't have done initially when I had bad habits. Cause I just hadn't built up the, um, sustainability of the stuff. And I, I needed more, you know, I, I don't know, guardrails and being like, you can't do this on these days. It helped me get going. But now I do truly like listen to my body way more. Like I'll, I'll program out like the week ahead be like, Oh, this would be a good day to do, you know, chest stuff or whatever. But if I get there and I'm like sore or I'm not feeling, I just don't do it. You know, in the same way too, with, um, with lots of stuff, with fat, intermittent fasting. If I wake up, I've had some random mornings where I wake up at 9 a.m. and I'm just ravenous, Starving. which is weird for me. And I'm like, I'm just going to eat. Like, I'm going to be fine because I already have hundreds and hundreds of days of this, you know, program or whatever, this lifestyle that works for me right. that I know it's not going to derail me off of it too. And so I do think that is like the next level that I think is you're trying to get it to is ultimately listening to your body. The problem is if you're like inherently lazy and your body's always like, fuck this, I don't want to do anything. Well, then that's not going to work. But like once you've developed a really good habit, it's almost like when people talk about, you know, I think I've seen Bales talk about this too with like games and sports, like actually knowing the rules really well, that's when you start to break them a little bit too. And you get the most benefits from approaching it from a slightly different angle. Yeah, that's kind of interesting because I do the exact opposite of that. I do not like if I show up, if I'm really tired someday at the gym, I'm like, I guess I'll I'll put I'll do an extra half scoop of pre workout or drink an extra cup of coffee or something. I like uh, I I just started a new program, and this morning I was a uh, an act like I was supposed to be active recovery, so like walking or stairmaster or whatever only. And I was like, I'm not gonna go to the gym and not do any strength training. Like, I, I just can't do that. Like it's, I feel like it'll fuck me up. I feel like if I 
am in my own house and my own bed and my own schedule, if I purposely betray that program, I could just be, I could just be a fatty again in like no time flat. So I can't, I can't do that. And, and that's fair. And I should actually say almost, I would say like 95% of the time, it just means tweaking what I'm going to do, right? Like I've already carved out this time to do something, but what I've done is try to say that just doing anything, just doing something is still a win. You know, if I'm just sure. feeling completely exhausted or sore, I'm going to go for an hour walk with April. And am I going to get yeah. as much of the cardiovascular strength benefits? No, but I'm still doing something. And same, I've had these days where I'm just like feeling sore. I'm like, I'm just going to do yoga. I'm just going to throw on a yoga with Adrian and do a 30 minute yoga class. I'm just going to continue the momentum of doing stuff. So I work the like habitual muscle, but I'm not going to beat myself up for not doing the thing that I initially intended to do because it doesn't fit where I'm at on that specific moment. Yeah, I think that's I think that's GTO. Like that's the the point the point to me is just whatever your active time is, it's got to be something active. It can't be playing video games cuz you don't feel good or whatever. For for me, that's the way. That's the way it is for me. I also uh, this is this is totally non-related, but I just saw your jersey in the background. This is so weird. I was googling for stock images the other day and mm -hmm. I found an old army wide receiver named Patrick Laird, not even that what? Old. like he like to like you army university, uh, army college, whatever, 2003, uh, or, 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 or just a, a guy I was, I was shook by that. I was gonna, I was gonna text you guys, but I was on my computer and I can't text you on my computer Wait, because you have an uh, Android. I'm going to pull this up. If you guys are on my YouTube channel, I'm going to doing a, a screen share here. Um, there you Look go. At, You're and he's not even like obviously he's not as handsome as Pat, but it's like you know you could tell me they were cousins. That's really funny. Uh, yeah, I wonder. Yeah, if 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 they were somehow related, although I assume Laird is a pretty uh, common last name. What is that? Uh, Scottish, probably. Yeah, who knows? Look at this. That's crazy. Yeah, six three, two two nineteen. Went to Army, played wide receiver three years there. Uh, had a 23% career market share. No, uh, I just, <laughs> <laughs> um, he played a little on defense too. It looks like he had some, some defense and fumbles, did some kick and punt returns, a very versatile athlete. Um, that should be our new bit is, uh, replacing Patrick Laird with this Patrick Laird is our favorite, uh, former. I saw, uh, I saw, athlete. cause I Googled him after I found the stock image. I think he's pretty active on LinkedIn. So I think we could find him. That's funny. There yeah. you go. How, how, how did you, how did you end up uh, finding that? Well, I am uh -oh. fell down. I'm following uh, in, in Karain and Gretch's footsteps and I'm going to start a fantasy football newsletter and I got the first post done and I needed to go find an image. So I was Googling creative commons images for wide receivers and I clicked on the one cause it was like maybe a good photo and it was, it said army wide receiver, Patrick Laird. And I was like, so stunned. I had to do some investigation. Love it. Okay. So well, bearing the lead there. Yeah. What's, uh, what's the new newsletter? I mean, it's, it's I really, it's just, uh, instead of my stuff existing wherever, uh, existing on Twitter or existing on the take cast Patreon, I figured it just makes more sense to centralize it all and just, and just have a place for just fantasy football. So I'm, I'm re uh, reviving the old, um, reviving the old uh, DFS column, automatic absolutes. Yeah. I remember that. Um, so yeah, it'll just be, I'm, I'm just going to do it once a week, but it'll just be rankings or the, the first post I have is about like why every wide receiver in this draft class weighs less than I do. And, and <laughs> like what that, what that might mean, like that seems like a problem. Um, but yeah, it's just something I've been wanting to do for a while. And they, they, my schedule is different at work now. So I used to do a TV show every day for an hour and a half, like right in the middle of the day. And now they're kind of changing my schedule up. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're on a different, we're on a different vibe now. So I got more, I got a little bit more time during the middle of the week on my hands now. 
Yeah. I w yeah. I was curious, like what angle you were going to take it from like, cause obviously like the newsletter that I added, it's more of like an escape from like doing fantasy content. Like obviously I'll talk yeah. about it a little bit, but it's more like, it's very take casty, right? Like the things we would talk about on the take cast are the things I like having an uh, outlet for writing about, but this is going to be more of an extension of your fantasy analysis. Yeah. Cause I, cause I, the, the take cast stuff just exists and perpetu like I, if I want to write something about Bitcoin or top shot or what, whatever, I can just go put that on the take cast Patreon, but it, some yeah. people don't, some people don't want that. They don't want to hear, they don't want to hear about golf. They don't want to hear about Bitcoin. They follow my account because Evan Silva retweeted me 10 years ago. <laughs> and they're like, I'm, I'm literally only here for fantasy football. That's all I care about. And uh those people i love those people you know fantasy football is my first love so are you gonna are you gonna set any talk about you know uh building habits are you gonna put commit to a regular release schedule or just vibes only once, once a week once a week yeah. uh i'm not gonna say it's always gonna be wednesday it's always gonna be thursday it's always gonna be friday because i've got myself into trouble with that with this program because i always try and have it out on wednesday but I, I've noticed what happens, like this happened last week, is everyone I wanted to have on, uh, so I had one person cancel on me, and then I, I asked a couple other people, and they were like, ah, oh, I'm not available until next week, and then all of a sudden it's Wednesday at 3.37 Central Time, and I'm like, you know what, I'll just kick the can down the road, I'll just, I'll just do one next week, right, because in my mind, it's got to be done on Wednesday, instead of doing one on Thursday, doing one on Friday morning, yeah. or whatever, so an example of uh, how we kid ourselves very easily for sure. Yeah. And you have to, yeah, you, and you want it to be sustainable, right? Like, again, this goes back to the thing. You don't want it to feel like a chore, right? Like you're just adding this because you think it'd be fun and a nice like outlet for some other stuff. You don't want to dread opening up, you know, the editor every time. Uh, so I, I think that, I think that's smart. And, you know, I've been writing the fantasy life newsletter, um, you know, daily for like almost three years now. Now I don't write it, um, as frequently because we have more contributors we got Dwayne, we got ian kendall we'll have guest writers do it and but like just knowing how much goes into writing a daily newsletter and how like draining it can be like every single day um i do think it's smart not to uh you know assign yourself a too rigid uh publishing schedule yeah uh i mean look maybe eventually chat gpt will just do it for me right i'll just be like uh give me 800 words on jackson smith and jigba and uh we can we can be done here i i think that's what a lot of people in the content space want you know it, and it's so yeah we should talk about it because obviously like chat gpt's all the the rage right now people are using it for like content ideas um i'm more interested in like the macro of like how you feel about ai stuff because i wouldn't want to i don't want to go as far as saying like i'm scared but i do think people are being naive if they don't think that this technology isn't going to an ex accelerate at an extremely fast um, trajectory um, over the next year or two years. Well, I do have lots of thoughts on AI. The first is more about what we would be interested in, which is like art and writing and stuff. Yeah. And uh, Jay, our, our old buddy, Jay Caspian Kang, actually had an article about AI in writing the other day and his summary landed pretty close to mine, which is that I actually don't think we are even in the realm of AI writing compelling fiction. I think we're so far away from it because it just, and maybe honestly, maybe it's because writing is, is so human, or maybe it's just because the, the way these things are programmed, it, it just can't quite figure it out yet. But every bit of AI writing I've ever heard, you could just, you could, pin it out of a lineup you're like either that's a freshman lit major or that is chat gpt writing it like it just it just sounds stilted it doesn't sound human but i think the i think it's very clear that a large portion of american companies are going to want to use ai to do all kinds of jobs all kinds of stuff and it'll be pretty possible for them to do that with what a uh you know Ten thousand dollars a month of GPU processing to the to the OpenAI website, they'll be able to replace so many jobs. Um, 
and that's that's coming. There, there's also this whole other sect that I don't see people talk about that often, which is like AI uh, doomers. You know, AI is gonna is gonna take over the world, and yeah. once they become sentient, the super intelligence angle. Yeah, yeah. Which I don't. I mean, I I don't know enough about computing um, to get there. Which I, I can't say I can't say I have a real opinion on as of yet. I just like I, I watched uh, there's this comedian, Adam Conover, and he made a video like a takedown of AI. And it was basically just making fun of like its current state, which I think you can in the same way you were just saying, like, you know, its ability to generate unique, you know, nonfiction or fiction or whatever from like a literary standpoint. And some of the use cases are, are kind of silly and, and broken right now. But if you work under the thesis that this chat GPT-4 specifically is a pretty big breakthrough in technology. And you accept the thesis that technology accelerates exponentially. And you could go look through time at how quickly we advance relative um, or how we have like what we have now in 1920 versus the leaps we made from like 1980 to 2010. Like it's nowhere close. And I do think you have to extrapolate where this is going. And to your point, how many things are going to get automated? This feels so much different than blockchain as a buzzword, because it's not just companies trying to get people to show up for their webinar with a with a buzzword, right? They're actually going to start using these tools to automate tasks and reduce their their overhead costs and you know actually use this technology. And I do think because there's going to be so so much incentive to use it that this trajectory with AI is going to happen faster than people realize, if that makes sense. I mean, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen extremely fast, right? Yeah. I mean, like basically it's like, once companies realize job X can be done by ChatGPT, that's it, man. Like they're just gonna do it. And uh, like, I mean, look, there are already these examples of like Taco Bells with no human employees or whatever. And what's really gonna happen is once, uh, once boomers start retiring, and elder millennials start taking over these positions it's like right away right because like there are still like i go golf with my uncle or whatever and he's like you can't pay me via venmo i don't have venmo and i'm like once those group of people are not calling the shots anymore it's it's a whole different ball game well yeah and i i would say too like what i've been trying to do lately is i just i've been leaving chat gpt up like and on one of my windows and i'll just use it throughout the day just trying to get familiar with how to ask it prompts you know i'm trying to get it to do timestamps right now for my shows it's not quite there yet but i'm fiddling around with that i'm i'm like an idiot when it comes to like google sheets and excel and i've been using it a ton i'm just telling it exactly what i want and it's been spitting out an exact formula. And unlike you could say like, Oh, I could just go Google, like how to do something. I can tell it. I'm literally looking at B cell B six and B eight right now. I want you to code this up for that. And I can literally copy the code. It spits out directly into the cell and it's done for me. And so I'm just trying to integrate it into my life and try to make things easier. And I do think as it accelerates, having the skill of being a good prompt writer and knowing how to get out of the systems, like what you want is going to be a very valued skill. And that, you know, I had asked Andy about this on the club show of like, oh, should people be worried? Like, hey, this is gonna come replace your job. Like he was saying, just think of it as a chance to learn another skill. And, you know, before the, the you know, AI becomes sentient and the, the machines take over, the people who can manipulate and use the AI are going to be the most valuable workers and knowledge workers up until that point. So I think everyone should be messing that's, around with it. That's already a job. It. That's yeah. already a job, right? Is is uh, Chat GPT asker is is like already like a position that people are being hired for, and I I I get so annoyed with it um, when it's when it's down, right? It's like nothing's yeah. more annoying than like oh like I have like a Chat GPT prompt I want to ask and it's down. I you get, got a like, spring I, for GPT four twenty bucks a month. It's a tax write off. Get it. So I I tried to I I because I had something I was trying to do with it yesterday. And I was trying, I was trying to get to the payment window or whatever, and I couldn't find the 20 bucks a month option. I could only find the per token option. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm not doing that because I could, you know, who knows? Like I could rack up myself quite a bill if, if things went a certain way, but yeah, obviously I need to spring for it. Yeah. I I've, I'm, I'm enjoying using it as a tool while simultaneously really extrapolating. And like, I legitimately think Davis, like, 
the world in five years is going to look so different than it does now. And that's kind of my overall thing. I don't know what exactly that means or how that's going to happen, but I do really think the jump from 2018 to 2023 is going to pale in comparison to the jump from 2023 to 28. So what uh, what would be what would be your advice to people to get uh, to get ahead of that? Just to have it open and learn how it works and figure out how you can maybe monetize it. Well, that's that's what I'm doing too, and like I think um, that's how I'm approaching it. Of just like I want to get really good at it and harness it, and you know it's it's fun and it's actually making things more efficient. Like I said, you know I would be you know jamming my head against the wall, and I've heard other people say you know people who are learning how to code that it is like legitimately accelerated what they can do by like 10 years. They're like, this would have taken me 10 years to get to this point. Um, I have a friend who works at GitHub and they have an AI integration because GitHub is also owned by Microsoft, who's an investor in open AI. And so there's all these like intertwined thing. And they have something with coding called um, Copilot. And you don't even ask chat GPT anything. It's looking at your code in real time and basically suggesting autofill type stuff as you code. And so I was talking to my friend and he's like, this stuff I would generally have to look up or these like pattern matching strings that you could never remember. It's like, it's doing it all for you. Like in real time, it's like, you're going to do something. And then like someone comes in with the crutch or the assist on like every little thing as you code. And so I just, it, it's, it's crazy how quickly this is, is accelerating things. That is creepy to me. Like not creepy, yeah. but like, that is, that is like, that's the the scene in the movie that you know that's the scene in the 1980s tech thriller where the computer starts predicting what you're thinking and you're like how did you know that and then yeah. the computer speaks back to you it's like actually it's a very simple algorithm blah, blah. and then you're like no nah, fuck this this is this is beyond what i signed up for well and that that's what blows my mind with the ai stuff too is you think about like other tools of like you say you'd have to like google or redo the prompt like when you're having a conversation with the ai it literally is getting smarter as you talk to it and i can say something like i don't have to relist my whole prompt i can be like no can you tweak that but make it cell c3 instead of cell c2 and then it spits it out from there like i don't have to you know if you call someone on tech support and they're like we need to transfer you to someone else and then you have to explain your whole thing from the start to that new person right and you're like don't you just have a record or whatever and so you can see what i previously talked about that chat gpt it's like you never have to go back to the start like you're building on what you've already established in a way that is very uh, helpful and also very scary to your point yeah, I can't, I, I can't get there. I, 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 well, I guess what I'm saying is I, I can't say for certain these, it's good that these things exist. Like maybe it is, maybe it ends up being that good, but some of it seems pretty, some it seems pretty scary to me. Well, don't you think you could, could have had we, you know, you and I in what, 1985, if we had been uh, born yet, uh, could have had a conversation like this about the internet. Be like, think about all the ways the internet could be used for harm and for bad stuff too, where, and you can make the case it, it's, it's swung wildly in both directions, right? I assume AI is going to be, uh, like I mean, that. I think probably, I think probably at this stage, most people would say internet net positive, but it is ruining some people's lives for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I, I don't my, know. My, yeah. If you could, if you could sign up for an internet free life, if you could just go live on like a beautiful Dutch tulip farm with your wife and beautiful child and never have to be online again, like, wouldn't you probably do it? Uh, yeah, probably. I, in that thought experiment, do you have the knowledge of this previous life where you were plugged into the matrix or is this like, uh, you get to show up men in black style and you don't, no, 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 you are, you are, you are, uh, you are, are, um, red pilled you are you're awake you know your life and you know that you consciously made a choice to go uh milk goats in yeah. the netherlands with your wife and child yeah i i do think i would accept that and i actually this is like another interesting thing too is it's probably easier for you and i to justify like screen time and being like um criminally logged online because this is also how we make a living and yep. our entire social networks our entire audiences um our employers um you know people who subscribe to our stuff all of them are online and interacting with them like building an audience building a brand all of that 
inherently have has to happen online. So we can fool ourselves or tell ourselves like, no, I do need to respond to this DM. I knew I do need to respond to this email. I do wonder if, are we so broken that even if we didn't have that excuse, would we still be as criminally online? Or is that actually making our relationship worse because we have a quote unquote excuse? Well, for sure it's worse, right? Because any, like, I mean, this is what, this is what we just got done talking about. Anything where you can, anything that your brain can generate an excuse that it doesn't question for, uh, you're going to allow yourself to do that much more often. And yeah, it's clearly like, clearly I think you and I can acknowledge on some very base level, we would be at our purest, happiest selves if we were doing something else less online less more removed from the internet more engaged in uh true social face-to-face -face relationships no doubt about it no doubt it, in my mind it, it, i i 100 agree because i truly know it i'm not just saying this because like uh you know I'm, I'm some family man or whatever but like truly the best times of my week are when lauren and i take april out for long walks normally on weekends where we have a lot of extra time but throughout the week too when it's nice out and we don't have devices and we'll go on like a, a 90 minute walk and we catch up on everything and it truly is like this cleansing Thing and like barely rewiring my brain for a little bit of time. And I, I do think I would love to chase that more, but again, by necessity, there's stuff that needs to be done. You know, there's things that need to be done and people who need to be responded to online. So the second you get back, it's like, all right, now let me catch up on the stuff I missed. But I agree with you. I, I would love to have more of that. Which is exactly why when AI can finally produce entertaining fantasy football content, that'll just be it for us. You know, we could just be we can just be done. We can be free. Yeah, it is. I do think that is the the one thing that like I don't have fear of. You know, loot because like what we I would say both of us like we provide like an entertainment. We're product. we're we're not we're not giving you picks. It's it's entertainment. People like people. It's a we we have developed a parasocial relationship with the people who listen to our programs and talk to us online. You know, it's not it's not so much about. Uh, what we're saying it's it's how we say it right yeah so i'm not like i'm not worried about you know uh, an ai bot now hosting my streams and you know getting all that like uh but i i do think i want to like just to put a bow on it like i i, I don't want to dismiss like the ai stuff and be like oh it can't do everything we want it to do right now so it's dumb like i do really think it should be something you're engaging with um even on a simple level just to be familiar as it becomes more prevalent yeah so however i mean once they once they perfect the uh the deep fake voice technology and you can just type in 45 minute podcast about the 2027 incoming dynasty rookie running back class with pat corain and davis maddock then i'm gonna be in trouble when when the deep when the deep fakes get that deep then then we will be in real trouble that is the one of the beauties about fantasy and specifically football, right? Is in, in the same way poker, right? That poker can be solved and yet there's still someone who you can suck at poker and wake up with pocket aces or you can wake up with a bad hand and still suck out on the river. There will be an element of variance. We could try to project what the oblong football or whatever is going to do, but we still aren't going to be able to do that ever with 100% accuracy. And I think that's what makes this stuff so fun. We can all have, and I was thinking about this the other day, Davis, like how debates take place online or like say the Trey Lance thing, right? Not that I want to relitigate this right now, but just as an example of like, say that like something has a 55% chance or a 60% chance of happening. Say that's the like quote unquote sharp side, but like 40% of the time, the other thing happens, you will have just massive, like huge disagreements over that spread of 20% range of outcomes where the people on the 60% side think they're completely right. And the 40% side people are just complete idiots who don't know anything. And like, that's, what's so fascinating about all this stuff is like, we're all arguing about like five to 20% swings, like with all of this shit. And yet we act like there's no way that we could be wrong or someone else could be right. Which, I mean, I, I still, I struggle with that a lot. Right. I mean, I, I still, I still struggle with the, I got this thing right. So I'm a genius, not, I was right. 30% of the time. And I got lucky to get away with that one there. I mean, that is, 
that is one of the hardest, I think that is the hardest thing about what we do is, is remaining level-headed and measured regardless of the results, especially when the results match up with your priors. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and again, I mean, part of the arguing and all of this stuff is because it's, it's fun. You know, we, we love debating this stuff and, uh, and there, there's always a, a new debate there, but I just do think it is interesting that like most of the time, um, people are making super hard stances on stuff where if you actually acknowledge the, the range of outcomes and the probabilities, the spread isn't that big. Yeah. All right, man, let's get out of here. Let's, uh, Let's tell the people what can they what can they be looking out for? What uh, what's what's the next big what what is your sequel to all the money is in week seventeen? Have you been have you been brainstorming for a year? Uh, so like I said, I am working on a video like the anatomy of a, a million dollar uh, lineup. So that one, I think I'll probably drop that. You know, those things take me forever to make, but the script is is almost done. Hopefully, that's out by when Best Ball Mania drops. But I do to your question, I have. I, I did a quick little interview with Pat for this video and was asking about something. And he like worded something in a way that I hadn't heard him talk about his lineup. And it actually really got the juices flowing on something that could be like a very hot topic in best ball. And so I'll just tease that for now. Uh, I'm working with Michael Dubner a little bit on it. So I might have something fun. Um, I don't know if it is as catchy as week 17 is all that matters though. It'll be we just to gotta you, we gotta we gotta run it back. I mean, you gotta make week seventeen is all that matters again too, right? The return the return of week seventeen, like that's well, the that's the direction it's gotta head. My my, my honest to god hope uh, is that underdog engineers the best ball mania contest to where there's a direct incentive to try to have the best team weeks one through fourteen. And I think if they could turn it into the same way, a dynasty league, half the, half the league is trying to get first, half the league is tanking. If you could make it to where half the people in your draft room are trying to have the best team weeks one through 14 and the other half are trying to optimize for week 17, I think that would make the draft rooms in that contest very, very fun. That's what I'm rooting for as a player this year. I agree. I want, I want more emphasis placed on the regular season obviously this is never going to happen, but less top heavy prizes would be great as well. Crane's like less top heavy prizes, bro. That, what are yeah. you talking about? Um, yeah. So yeah, that's, so, that's my hope. What, uh, so yeah, so you can keep an eye out for that deposit kingdom YouTube channel. Uh, been doing, working on some similar videos over for fantasy life, been doing shorts for them, been writing the newsletter. So you can always check that out at fantasy life. Dot com And then, yeah, my newsletter, uh, Friday's P.O. Box, uh, I recommend it. And Davis, we'll get to do, you're using the same platform I do, Beehive, for your newsletter. You and I will be able to do a little uh, cross-promotion there. When can the people expect your newsletter to drop? This afternoon, I'm gonna. I'm, I'm wrapping up. I'm wrapping up the. I'm wrapping up the first one. So probably by the time you guys are listening to this, I will have already tweeted out the first uh, little piece of content, a little content nugget for everyone. So well, there we go. If you need a, if you need a little uh, tour uh, in the beehive or you have questions, uh, I have spent a lot of time in there and can uh, can help you out. Yeah, you spend a lot of time in there, but I realized that I cost you money because you get stuff for uh, link uh, ref re referring people, and I didn't use a referral link for you. No, it's, so it's fine. So it's uh, fine. G GG, well played to you on that one. No, but they have a cool recommendations feature uh, that I'll show you, and we'll be able to like cross uh, recommend newsletters, and it uh, it helps for sure. There we go. All right, well, people sign up for the PO box. Uh, What's yours going to be called? Automatic absolutes. Oh, okay. Dot, Sorry. I didn't know if com. that was just the column or the whole thing. So. Yeah. It's there. It's not, it's not that clever, but it's kind of clever. It's half, it's half as clever as the PO box, which is to me like nine out of 10 clever. Um, so the link to that will be in the description of the show. We'll get it posted. Uh, Pete and I will be back for the swole cast next week, I guess. And, uh, I'll be on ADP chasing on Friday and, uh, 